medical deferred action was part of a small set of temporary relief options offered by USCIS. The immigrants granted this protection under humanitarian grounds would not be prioritized for removal by the government. USCIS has said it has received about a thousand deferred action requests a year, but that the majority have been denied. Going forward, excuse me, USCIS said it will defer to Immigration and Customs Enforcement, or ICE, so that agency can determine whether to grant non-military deferred action. ICE has said its agents have the discretion to determine which individuals will be prioritized for deportation, but an agency official recently told CBS News that ICE does not accept applications for deferred action. Along with their arguments that the decision to scrap the program will jeopardize the lives of vulnerable immigrants and children, Democrats and immigrant advocates have lambasted the administrations for not notifying the public or Congress about the shift in policy. In a letter to top officials at the Department of Homeland Security, which oversees USCIS, more than 100 congressional Democrats said they were concerned about what amounts to USCIS outsourcing deferred action requests to ICE, an agency most undocumented immigrants fear because it carries out deportations. Requiring that pres prospective applicants request this humanitarian relief by applying to an immigrant enforcement agency that detains and deports hundreds of thousands of immigrants annually will deter many vulnerable children and families from coming forward and seeking life-saving protection, the lawmakers wrote. Kind of the point, I think. So, once again, playing politics with people's lives. Let's move onward. I don't think I need to comment on that very much. Uh, they tried to do it. Everybody yelled about it, so they go, oh, well, we're going to, you know, we're not really doing it yet, but we're doing it in the future. So they're still doing it. They're just trying to backtrack a little bit so it doesn't seem quite so harsh and quite so awful. Ah. Yeah. These are people, remember. And the people that we're talking about, they said on oh, it, like, what, a thousand a year? I mean, how big a deal is that? But they're just nipping away at every possible avenue that anybody has for um, not being deported. And if a few people die, well, what's the problem with that? Who cares? They're just immigrants, right? So, number four. The administration rushed on a sweeping immigration policy. We found substantive sloppy mistakes. All right. Here's their story. This month, the Trump White House unveiled a new policy it had aggressively pushed through the regulatory process that makes it much harder for low-income immigrants, especially those who had used public benefits, to come to or remain in the United States. The proposal, we've talked about this one many times, known as the public charge rule, since it creates a complicated test to determine whether an immigrant is, quote, likely to be a public charge, end quote, has the potential to dramatically restrict who's allowed to settle in the country. And many people who work with immigrants, including social service providers and local and state governments, are worried that it will scare them away from using benefits they and their families need to thrive. To soften the blow, the rule contains a few exceptions. Groups of immigrants who are allowed to use public benefits without jeopardizing their future immigration status. But the rule is so sloppily written that it ended up treating immigrants who are married to U.S. citizens more harshly than immigrants married to non-citizens. Hmm. Active duty service members who are immigrant non-citizens are allowed to use benefits without having it weigh against them as a public charge in the future. So are the family members of active duty immigrant service members. But immigrants who are the spouses or children of active duty service members who are U.S. citizens are not included in the exception, meaning their use of benefits while their spouses were on active duty could jeopardize their future in the U.S. It's sloppy drafting. They're trying to get the regulation out sooner than is probably practical, said Charles Wheeler, an immigration attorney at the Catholic Legal, Immig Legal. Excuse me, 
Catholic Legal Immigration Network, Incorporated. A spokeswoman for U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services, the agency that developed and is implementing the rule, declined to comment because of pending litigation against the regulation. Three lawsuits have been filed challenging the policy, one by a coalition of 13 states and filed in Washington State, one by San Francisco and Santa Clara County in California, and one by a coalition of nonprofit groups in California. A White House spokesman did not respond to a request for comment. The regulation's full text, detailed in 217 pages of three-column text in the Federal Register, contradicts its own implementing language regarding how the new rule will apply to military families. The government estimates it will take 16 to 20 hours just to read the regulation. In the form that's supposed to implement the rule doesn't distinguish between families of service members who are citizens and service members who are not citizens, although the form's instructions do. There are so many unknowns at the moment with how this regulation is going to be interpreted and applied for immigrant family members, Wheeler said. And certainly that complexity is going to discourage people from even applying for green cards and for benefits. The public charge regulation has been a top priority for the Trump White House, especially senior policy advisor Stephen Miller. For over a year, the White House has been pressuring USCIS to move more quickly to get it out the door. But the rule's confusing treatment of military families demonstrates sloppy work. It has created inconsistencies between the rule's technical text and the forms under development to implement it. The confusion over military families is one reason many social service providers, local and state governments, and lawyers are concerned that the rule's impact will be much broader than its intended targets. With so much complexity and uncertainty about who will be treated differently under the new rule and how, they say it's inevitable that immigrants who are supposed to be targeted under the rule will be scared away from using public benefits to which they're legally entitled. Under the new rule, which will go into effect in October, barring an injunction in one of the lawsuits, people applying for permanent resident status are subject to a complicated test of whether they're likely to become a public charge based on their income, education level, credit scores, and other factors. Past use of public benefits counts as a heavily weighted negative factor against an immigrant one that it would be hard for an applicant to overcome. At one point, the preamble to the regulation says that, quote, active duty service members, including those in the Ready Reserve and their spouses and children, are exempt from their use of public benefits being counted against them, implying that the exemption applies to all military families. In fact, it does not. Deepening the confusion, USCIS has a form for applicants that doesn't reflect the two standards mentioned in the rule. It asks immigrants applying for permanent residence to note, if appropriate, whether they are the spouse or the child of an individual who is enlisted in the U.S. Armed Forces or is in active duty or in the Ready Reserve component of the U.S. Armed Forces. It does not ask about the citizenship status of the military service member. So spouses and children of U.S. citizen service members would check yes on the question, even though the actual text of the regulation includes no exemption for them. Immigration lawyers and benefits experts contacted by ProPublica could cite no reason why the regulation would treat immigrants married to U.S. citizens more harshly than immigrants married to non-citizens, and they concluded that the double standard might have been unintentional. Asked why spouses of U.S. citizens might be excluded, Stacy Dean, Vice President for Food Assistance Policy at the Center on Budget and Policy Priorities, speculated, they didn't think of it? Clearly, it's so complicated that nobody understands it right now, said Margaret Stock, an immigration lawyer with many military clients. They're going to make mistakes. They're going to be massive amounts of confusion. Doug Rand, a former White House official who worked on immigration issues in President Barack Obama's administration, summed up the contradictory message around the active duty exemption. Quote, this is chaos. End quote.
The treatment of military families is especially odd because the Department of Defense, unlike other arms of the federal government, like the Department of Veteran Affairs, took an active role to minimize the rule's impact on military families. In the Federal Register preamble, USCIS wrote that the DOD worried that the new regulation may give rise to concerns about service members' immigration status or the immigration status of service members' spouses and children. Too much in that statement. Sorry, I don't do that. (laughs) I don't make that sound very well. Which would reduce troop readiness and interfere significantly with U.S. Armed Forces recruitment efforts. Those concerns would appear to apply equally to immigrants married to citizens and those married to non-citizens. A DOD spokeswoman confirmed to ProPublica that the agency was consulted on the regulation, but she declined to comment about the exclusion of spouses and children of U.S. citizens from the active duty exemption. It's not clear what exactly the impact of the double standard would be. In general, the immigrants who are targeted by the public, the, 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 the public charge, the public targeted by the public charge regulations, are already legally ineligible for most public benefits, while military service members and their families are exempt from some of these restrictions, like the mandatory five-year waiting period before using any public benefits. Military spouses who are unauthorized immigrants, for example are still legally ineligible to receive most benefits. The concern raised by immigration lawyers and advocates, however, is that the public charge rule will scare immigrants who aren't targeted, such as those who already have green cards, out of trying to get benefits to which they are legally entitled, and deter immigrants who are targeted from using benefits that aren't covered in the rule. The regulation says, for example, that benefits obtained for children won't count against their parents. So theoretically, an unauthorized immigrant who is raising a U.S. citizen child alone while their active duty spouse is deployed can still apply for health insurance and food stamps for the child without damaging their future prospects for a green card. But it's not at all clear whether military families themselves will get that message, especially because the regulation contradicts itself about their treatment. The public charge regulation has been in development for much of President Donald Trump's tenure, with drafts being circulated and published by the press in February 2018. While the Pentagon fought for exemptions to the policy for active duty military and their families throughout 2018, The VA several times declined to do the same for veterans, according to emails obtained by ProPublica under a Freedom of Information Act request. The public comment period for the regulation began in September 2018 and ended in early December. Over that time, the draft regulation received an unprecedented 266,000 public comments, which the government was legally obliged to read and respond to, in addition to finalizing the text of the regulation itself. However, the Trump administration, led by Miller, was eager to finalize the regulation as quickly as possible and pressed agencies to complete it. Miller even criticized USCIS Director Frank Cisna over his perceived slowness in developing and finalizing the public charge regulation. Quote, The timeline on public charge is unacceptable, Miller wrote to Cisna in June 2018 in an email reported by Politico this month. Quote, This is time we don't have. I don't care what you need to do to finish it on time. End quote. In March 2019, after the comment period ended, Miller yelled at Cisna during a meeting to finalize the rule more quickly, according to an April report from the New York Times. You ought to be working on this regulation all day, every day, the Times quotes Miller as saying. It should be the first thought you have when you wake up, and it should be the last thought you have before you go to bed. And sometimes you shouldn't go to bed. End quote. Nice. As White House officials scrambled to complete the regulation's initial draft version last year, they made clear to federal agencies that the decision to propose the drastic change to how immigration law is enforced had already been made. Agencies were discouraged from arguing against the central thrust of the policy, according to the emails obtained by ProPublica. Having trouble talking. Quote, 
Please do not worry about non-substantive line edits, a White House official whose name is redacted wrote in bold type in July 2018 and again in September. Please recognize also that the decision of whether to propose expanding the definition of public charge broadly has been made at a very high level and will not be changing, end quote. So again, these are people's lives that are being caught up in this desire to appear to be or to actually be tough on immigration. Whether it's the, for appearance's sake or for the actual toughness's sake, it kind of doesn't matter because either way there are people being affected by this and the gamesmanship is apparent throughout. All right, moving on. Here's another story. Trump's use of immigration as a 2020 wedge issue could backfire on other policies. Hmm. So here's someone actually talking about how playing politics might not be such a good thing. We'll see what they have to say. Donald Trump's push to restrict immigration is clashing with policy goals in ways that detractors and even some supporters say could hurt his 2020 re-election bid. It's happened, they note, on everything from Trump's effort to weaken Iran's Islamist regime to his attempts to strike a trade deal with Mexico to his push to oust Venezuelan strongman Nicolas Maduro. And it could happen on gun control if Trump tries to wed expanded background checks with an immigration overhaul. To pro-immigrant advocates, Trump simply wants to inject immigration into his many discussions to keep it alive as an election wedge issue. They argue he's blind to the consequences that it is having on his other major initiatives. Everything you see is about 2020, said David Leopold, a prominent immigration lawyer and Trump critic. He uses the issue, a very serious policy issue, a complicated policy problem, immigration. He uses it for purely selfish political reasons to throw red meat to his base. But others insist he is purely going off instinct. Mark Krikorian, the executive director of the Center for Immigration Studies, which favors curbing immigration, laughed when asked if there was a strategy behind some of Trump's moves. Quote, There are both supporters and detractors of his who imagine he's playing 40-dimensional string theory chess, when in fact he's just operating from his gut, he said. Regardless, Trump's approach to immigration has, intentionally or not, gotten mixed up with his administration's other initiatives. One major Trump foreign policy goal is forcing out Maduro, whom Trump no longer recognizes as Venezuela's president. Trump and his aides have pointed to Venezuela's misery and economic collapse, food and medicine shortages and corruption, as reasons why Maduro should be ousted. Hmm. Okay. But even as the Trump team has detailed the horrifying conditions that have led millions of Venezuelans to flee, it has ignored calls to grant Venezuelans in the United States temporary protected status so that they can stay in America even if they lack legal status. In fact, Trump has been trying to dismantle the entire TPS program, which has also covered people from several other nations riven with violence or natural disaster. Trump is also trying to cut down on the number of people granted asylum in the U.S., just as Venezuela has become a top source of asylum applications filed with U.S. Citizenship and Immigration Services. Okay, we just read another story about that where apparently he's reconsidering this for political reasons, but it's politics both ways, whether he does it or doesn't do it. It's all politics. It's not anything about what's actually going on. It's about what's perceived. Am I tough on immigration? Am I being tough enough? Anyway, another Trump foreign policy goal is to weaken the Islamist government in Iran. Using primarily economic sanctions, the president and his team are raising pressure on the clerical regime, and they say they're doing it in part to end the oppression of ordinary Iranians. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo has even implied that deteriorating, that's a hard word for me, deteriorating economic conditions in the country could cause Iranians to revolt against the regime. Quote, I think we can change, I think what can change is the people can change the government. 
That's a weird quote. Okay, he said, quote, I think what can change is the people can change the government. A weird quote. Pompeo told CBS News earlier this year, but Trump's expressed love for Iranians, he's called them great people, has been undercut by his decision to include Iranians in his infamous travel ban. Iranian activists point to the travel ban and Trump's tighter asylum policies as evidence Trump doesn't care about Iranians at all. It's like a slap in the face. The Trump administration is asking Iranians to rise up against their cruel regime, and at the same time they are not allowing them to take safe haven in the United States, said Leela Austin, executive director of the Public Affairs Alliance of Iranian Americans, a nonprofit advocacy group. Even some supporters of Trump's overall tough policy towards Iran say the travel ban was a mistake and that at the very least it should have been better tailored. Lift the travel ban and give thousands of H-1B visas and green cards to ordinary Iranians, Mark Dubowitz of the Foundation for Defense of Democracies, which has backed Trump's maximum pressure campaign against the Iranian regime, tweeted in April ban regime connected officials and their families from entering the U.S. Trump's tough immigration policies have at times damaged his standing with people who voted for him. For instance, many members of America's Iraqi Christian community supported Trump because he promised to do more to protect Christians overseas. That promise also led many evangelical Christians to support the president. But as part of his immigration crackdown, Trump has been trying to deport hundreds of Iraqi Christians back to Iraq, where many fear they'll face torture and death. Just this past week, a 41-year-old Michigan man deported to Iraq in June died because he could not obtain insulin in Baghdad to treat his diabetes. While the man, Jimmy Aldoud, was an Iraqi national, he had been in the U.S. since he was a young child and did not speak Arabic. Al-Duid was one of an estimated 160,000 Chaldean Catholics in Michigan, many of whom supported Trump in 2016. They now feel betrayed. There's a tremendous amount of anxiety in the community, said Martin Mana of the Chaldean Community Foundation earlier this week. Also this past week, following deadly mass shootings in Texas and Ohio, Trump signaled that he might support expanding background checks for people seeking to buy guns, but he also briefly floated the idea of marrying gun control to an immigration overhaul. Such a linkage would likely kill chances for either proposal to succeed. Trump's campaign insists his strict approach to immigration is actually well matched with the president's other initiatives, both at home and abroad. Quote, President Trump's first priorities will always be the safety and prosperity of the American people, which is why he has focused on border security and the enforcement of immigration laws, a Trump campaign spokesman said in a statement. He will also stand in support of freedom over tyranny around the world. These principles are compatible. I'm sorry, I cannot read these Trump statements in a regular voice because they're just too stupid. Anyway. In the run-up to the 2018 midterm elections, Trump used immigration as a major talking point, regularly in vain against caravans of migrants coming to the U.S. from Latin America. Despite Democrats racking up big wins in that election, Trump hasn't abandoned his anti-immigration emphasis. He shut down the federal government for a record 35 days in an unsuccessful bid to get Congress to fund the construction of a border wall with Mexico. The costly move angered workers in many industrial sectors, threatening a Republican talking point for 2020 about how well the U.S. economy is doing under Trump. Trump then stunned Washington in May when he threatened to impose tariffs on Mexico if it didn't do more to stop migrants from crossing into the United States. Even Republican lawmakers warned that the tariffs could threaten congressional approval of what Trump considers a top achievement his negotiation of a new trade deal with Canada and Mexico. They also noted the tariffs could hurt American workers, including many farmers who have supported Trump. Mexico has avoided the threatened tariffs so far by stepping up efforts to deter migrants from entering the U.S., but Trump's threats may also have spooked China, another country with whom he's engaged in trade talks, about whether he's reliable. 
The message that was received was that deals with the president, deals that the president makes, don't stick. You're always vulnerable to him coming back and wanting to change everything, said Bill Reich, an Asia expert with the Center for Strategic and International Studies. Trump is surrounded by some top aides, such as Stephen Miller, who are known to favor much tighter restrictions on immigration. But former Trump aides and even some of his critics say that's... Sorry, I'm killing myself here. Let me try that again. But former Trump aides and even some of his critics say that at the end of the day, it's Trump's own political instincts that drive his message. Trump's instincts apparently tell him that revving up anti-immigrant attitudes among some in the Republican base will work for him in 2020, even after the 2018 setback, and even if it means undercutting other policy goals. I don't think he cares about his legacy as much as he cares about the moment, said Frank Sherry, founder and executive director of America's Voice, a liberal group advocating for immigration reform. Sometimes Trump's immigration policy appears to undermine his immigration policy. Kokorian pointed out that while Trump talks of ensuring Americans having access to jobs, the president has also suggested that he wants to let in more immigrants to fill certain positions, such as temporary jobs in landscaping and housekeeping. And in June, the State Department confirmed that the United States will cut off future foreign aid funds to El Salvador, Guatemala, and Honduras, three Central American countries that are a major source of migrants to the United States. Trump says those countries aren't doing enough to stop their citizens from fleeing to America, but Republicans and Democrats in Congress have criticized his decision to cut off the funding. They argue that by ending support for programs that try to reduce violence and ease poverty, Trump's decision could spur even more people to migrate to the U.S. Some Trump critics wonder if Trump is intentionally trying to exacerbate the migration crisis through such moves so that he can point to it and his self-declared toughness on immigration as a reason why he should be re-elected. I think it's a terrible move, Leopold said, and he's going to learn that in 2020. Well, I have more stories, and... um, I don't have time to read them. It is now practically 8 o'clock, a couple of minutes away, and I've run to the end of my thing. Basically, my point was, as I stated earlier, that uh, people playing politics in the administration, primarily, are affecting people's lives. And, the, and these moves that you keep seeing, you noticed the the theme of all these stories was about how... Trump or the administration or whoever thinks these are good moves, these are good political moves, these are important to express toughness or to show resolve or to do this or to do that. And there's very little comment on what this does to people. It's all about the move, all about how it looks, how it sounds, how it plays, how it uh, reads, how it uh, seems to people. And... um, we need to start talking about what it does to people and how it, how it affects them and what's happening and what it means when you make these kinds of declarations, these kind of moves, and uh, create these kinds of situations. That's all the time I have. I will see you next time. Until then, have a great week.